Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's Telescope Talk Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, or in deep astronomy dot space, and today, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be talking about go to telescopes. Now, these are computerized telescopes. They're called go to because they are they are engineered in such a way that when you pick up the little keypad, you type in what you want to see, and it will go to it. Uh, they're very automatic. Some of them now, most of them now, even do their own polar alignment. So um, we're going to be talking about those telescopes today, about what they're like, their, about what the price range is, and really whether or not you should bother even considering getting one. Uh, or not. I have a lot of opinions on this particular kind of telescope topic, and so we are going to be discussing that today. And with me, as they are each time, are my two good friends, uh, John Suffel from the UK. He's down there on the bottom panel, and up to the right next to me is Adam Synergy from unseenpodcast.com. Hi, guys. Hello, Tony. Hello, Adam. Hey. Okay, so I've in past hangouts, I have been getting some grief about my audio because it's been hard. It's been uh, the guests have been loud and I have been faint. And I think the problem in part is because I need to get closer to this hang uh, the, to this microphone. As you can see, I'm right up in this microphone's grill. So hopefully you can hear me better. And if not, I trust you'll let me know in the live chat, which brings me to. What we wanted, we want you guys to get involved. We don't do these hangouts for our health. We, although we like each other very much and it's fun to talk about telescopes, uh, we want you to get involved. And the best way to do that is on the various live chat uh, venues on each platform. I'm on uh, YouTube where we're looking at the live chat right now, and I see several of you there already. Um, also on on Facebook, I'm looking at that as well on the uh, event page, and uh, <laughs> Jambo Bug Hunter is already on is already on uh, Facebook. So hi, Jambo. Uh, also on Twitch, I'm looking at the deepastronomy.com slash Twitch as well. Uh, and Uncle Bill Druin is here. Hi, Uncle Bill Druin. Thanks for joining us on Twitch. And finally, I think I'm on Periscope, but I'm starting to not care about Periscope because nobody seems to be interacting with us very much on that. So, uh, But I am on it, and I am there. But um, I won't see you if you... Uh, do much in the in the asking questions part because nobody ever does on, on on Periscope. Okay, now I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about something not related to telescopes. And if you don't want to listen for about two or three minutes, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to post the timestamp at the bottom of, in the description box after the hangout is over. You can just fast forward straight to that. But I really want to talk a little bit about where we're going with this particular hangout. Now we all, all three of us talked or before it started. And we are, I've been looking at the viewership numbers. I've been looking at, you know, the engagement level, things like that. It's been very good. Um, but I am starting to think that for now, at least, the frequency might be too much. Once a week might be too high for this particular topic. So our plan going forward is we are going to take a break next week, come back on August, what was it, 11th or 8th, 8th August 8th. Yes, Tuesday, August 8th, and we are going to talk about, our topic on that particular hangout will be the solar eclipse that's coming in America, how to view it, what you need to see it, where you should go, and all that kind of fun stuff, and it's going to be a full hour all about solar eclipses and looking at the sun through your telescope, and so that'll be in two weeks, and then after that, we're probably going to do this hangout once a month, probably on the first Tuesday of every month. Uh, my goal, hopefully, is to get some telescope manufacturers involved and help and help us maybe look at some equipment personally, maybe give you reviews of specific kinds of equipment, what we think of it and what we don't, what we like about it, what we don't like about it, things like that. Because right now, these Hangouts, if you've noticed, have been basically us giving you advice that is based on our past experience. We've given you a couple of brands of telescopes here and there, but we haven't really recommended all that much. So um, we're, I'd like to get into that a little bit more, but only if I can get some, some sponsor help with that. So I'm going to take some time in the coming weeks after, ne after two weeks to uh, get that going. And then on Tuesdays around this time, I'll probably post some other content, maybe in the form of vlog posts, which I need to also get more uh, posting in on. So that's our plan. Okay, so now we're going to get started with today's Hangout. Go to telescopes are, as I mentioned before, they're computerized. They are uh, supposedly easy to use. 
and they have been around since I guess about the early 1990s. The, the one I had was a Mead LX200. It was a 10 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope where uh, it had an, an old RS-232 serial port that I could connect to a computer, uh, but that was the only way I could really, it, was, it wasn't as as nice as it is now. Today it's pretty easy to do a lot of computer controlled stuff and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But um, the what I don't like about go-to telescopes, especially if you're a beginner, is it's a lot like um, having somebody take, take having to take an online course and having somebody else do all the tests for you. <laughs> you don't really learn how to see the night sky. You don't really get down and dirty with finding the crab nebula by hand or the ring nebula or the Andromeda galaxy or whatever it has to be. I like there to be with like with Dobsonians this sort of hunt method that you should do in your learning curve. I think it's invaluable, and I don't think it can be um, it, it can be just sort of glossed over. But go to telescopes do offer an easy way to get in going with the night sky. And uh, John, you actually have one right now, right? Are you you use one as one of your main scopes? Why don't you tell us a little about about it? Uh, oh, I'm just bring let's <clears throat> bring the um up here show the screen that's it okay. um this is mine it's an, uh, an eq5 now that started off as um a normal eq5 with twiddly little knobs that used to um guide the telescope on the sky uh, then i added it to um a go to mainly because i want to get into um astrophotography and for that, you really need some um, a, a telescope mount that is driven. But when I do that, when I do get into the astronomy, I won't be using this um, telescope. I'll be using one of my smaller ones for one reason or another. Um, now, on this in this photo, I haven't put down, I haven't put on the counterweights, which come down down here, if you can see the um, curves here. Okay, so this is a picture without the counterweights. That's right. Yeah. Okay, and that's important, isn't it? Because you need to have this pretty balanced for the go-to to slew around, right? That's right. Um, the motors on them um, are fairly strong, but you do not want to burn them out. Otherwise, it, it's going to cost a lot of money to um, replace them. Are they stepper motors, or do you know? I'm not sure, to be quite honest. Okay, usually they have stepper motors, which are... They, these are a DC motor that can be controlled by computer, and they are delineated by how far each little when you apply power it clicks one part of a revolution and then you click it again with DC power and it clicks it again and that is makes it really nice for uh, telescope control but it's uh, battery powered John uh, mains mains powered right. okay so you plug it in um, yeah um, the handset which isn't shown um, you can um, plug it into a um, into an extension cord from your house, or from a, from a um, battery pack. Okay. All right. And so, as we talked about before, this is a Newtonian telescope. This is the kind of telescope design that's usually got big, fat tubes in it. This, you said this was an eight inch, correct? Twenty centimeters. That's right. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, these are really large uh, in terms of being computer controlled. When you go to how do you set it up, John? Do, what, what do you? What's the procedure that you use? All right. First of all, um, you've got to get um, this part of the mount, the tripod, absolutely um, level um, using um, spirit levels mainly. Once you've done that, then you add the mount itself. Now, one of these legs, it's um, this one on mine, is matched an N for no. And obviously, um, that at the um, at Polaris, that led at, at um, True North. Um, then you put the mount on. Now, there's a little telescope here going, going, coming up through this direction. Can you zoom that up a little bit for us? Uh, yep. Yeah, I see it now. So there's a little eyepiece. So you have to get down on your le uh, on your knee there and just sort of crane your neck and look up into that, uh, don't you? That's right. You've got to be um, you have to be knelt down on the floor, which is the, the one thing I don't like about um, 
about um, equatorial mounts. You've got to, they should, they should put um, a 90 degree, um, oops, whoa. <laughs> you really zoomed in there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, yeah, they should put a little uh, uh, 90 degree um, mirror lens on, or mirror uh, yeah. eyepiece holder on that. But then it'd flip it back, and then it'd make it, making your adjustments drive you crazy, I would imagine. So when you look at that eyepiece, you're looking close to the North Star, and your goal is to get that not centered because the Polaris isn't exactly north. It's a little bit offset, but you want to get it in the right spot, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I don't know if you can see that. I've got a little circle. Ah, now, um, as it, when you look through the um, eyepiece, you get a double circle. And after finding out where um, Polaris is at that moment in time, using uh, a program like Stellarium or Character Seal, um, you place the um, you place Polaris in, inside those circles at that spot. Now, you, um, you're an experienced observer. How long does that take you to do? It didn't take, well, the first time it took me maybe half an hour. Okay. Well, that's not so, that's not so bad. Now, you could also, John, if you wanted to, well, oh, well, let me, before I ask you this, what, what kind of adjustments do you have to get it, to get Polaris centered? You can't use the clock drive, right? You have to do the tripod adjustments. That's right, yeah. Okay. What, um, what are your adjustments there? I'll just give that second on. First of all, um, in um, azimuth, uh, left or right, there's this little um, knob down here. There's one on the other side as well. Um, and that will turn turn the, um, the entire mount left or right. Um, there's also an altitude one here, uh, which you um, adjust by these two um, bolts there. Whoops, did not do that. There and there. It's important to release one before you um, tighten the other. Otherwise, you're going to bend the bolts, and that is not going to be good. So, by by turning this, these these nuts and these bolts, you can then um, get um, Polaris perfectly, almost perfectly positioned. Okay. And um, now you said you use this primarily because you wanted to do any imaging, but have you ever relied on it to like uh, find stuff you could? I'm like, well, actually, now I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm rambling. What I want to ask you now is how you um, find objects in it. What do, now you listen, you've got it all polar aligned, uh, it's all set up and ready to go. Now, <clears throat> does it use by the by the way? Does it use a GPS receiver to tell it what date and time and latitude it's it, it's in? This one doesn't know. You okay, can, but some can, some do, sorry. folks. Nowadays, they do. They just you turn them on. They got a GPS receiver on board. They they look at where they are in the world and their date and time. And as long as it's level, um, it'll it'll align itself. But these are usually altazimuth mounts, not not equatorial like John's got here. So how do you tell it what you want to look at? When you get a handset. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't got it um, close by. So, um, it's a handset. So, it's um, just a big keypad, isn't it? Something like it's that. It's a big keypad, yeah. yeah. Um, and if you want to look at, say, M, M1, the Crab Nebula, um, you just press, um, I think it's just M, then 1, and then um, press to slew. It'll tell you, ask you if you want to actually slew. It'll ask you that, that um, two or three times. I don't know why. And eventually the telescope starts to move um, to find the Crab Nebula for you. And if you've got the... Um, there's also a two or three star alignment you've got to do first after polar aligning. You have to tell it... You have to center three very bright stars and then tell it which star it is they're looking at? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's important for other telescopes too. Okay. Well, uh, could you stop sharing your screen now for just a sec, and we'll get us yep. back up here. I want to read Uncle Bill's comment. He's like on on Twitch. I remember when GoTo was just a prototype made by a few hardware hackers and displayed without a scope on a table in star parties. The idea was that it would allow supernova hunters 
to search for a lot of well-memorized galaxies. It wasn't intended to be a cheat for beginners to avoid learning the roadmap of the sky. That's right, Uncle Bill. A lot of the, the, the first go-to scopes were hacked. They were, they were uh, built by people who wanted to automate their telescopes and things like that. Um, and, and really, I don't mean to call it a cheat. Uh, it's, it's okay. It's, there's nothing, I guess, really wrong philosoph I guess I have a philosophical issue with it but really it's it, you know if they help if it gets you outside under the stars I'm all for it what the heck I don't care but uh but I just would it be nice if you you know people would learn where the constellations are and things like that before they do anything else um all right so that's an equatorial mount um there are other kinds that you can get I wonder Adam or John if you wouldn't mind do you guys happen to have say a, a Mead um Schmidt Cassegrain uh, set up handy that we could show. So the, there is another kind of go-to telescope, which are with Schmidt Cassegrain design. Now, Schmidt Cassegrain is a very complicated reflector. They're generally quite expensive, and you'll see them a lot in the higher end telescope tubes. And they can be mounted either way, alt azimuth, like we talked about last week, or they can be in a polar mounted arrangement. If they're alt az, then um, yeah, there's one. That's a good one right there. That's a Meade LX200. That's basically your Chevy Impala of um, <laughs> of telescopes. It's good. It's uh, high quality optics, and the mount is very beefy. Look at those fork arms. See how beefy that is. That is pretty. That's pretty sturdy. But you can also see that price is in pounds. I think so. That is like that's a thirty three hundred, thirty two hundred dollar telescope right there. So it's not cheap. And that's an 8-inch. That's the same diameter that John was showing us, only it's a Schmidt cast. And that's in alt azimuth configuration. Now, that one, you can just level the mount, level the tripod, turn it on, let the GPS find itself, and off it goes. You can then start telling it where. It will do the three-star alignment itself. It will go find three stars on its own because it will say, okay, wait a minute. If I'm level right now and if I'm in... If I'm in uh, uh, Portugal, <laughs> then uh, I should see the following three stars right now. And then it'll go and it'll go find those three stars. And then it goes, ah, okay, good. I found those three stars. Now I know where everything is. What do you want to see? And off you go. You plug things in and start looking at stuff. And it's beautiful. It's really nice. I have to say, you know, it's like I said, these have been around since the 90s. They're quite nice. And, um, but... As Uncle Bill also comments on Twitch, digital cameras have opened up a whole new world of automated observation. And that, in my opinion, is where these scopes shine. Um, the Visual use, yeah, but it's a bit overkill, wouldn't you guys say? You don't need uh, a go-to scope just to observe. That You need no. them for uh, astrophotography, definitely. And you really need a, an equatorial mount for for astrophotography most of the go-to mounts nowadays that you see uh, for sale are on alt azimuth telescopes uh, which are good for uh observing they they sometimes suffer from uh, rotation of the field around the point around the field of view if you're looking at an object through an eyepiece you'll see the object you're looking at in the center but around the edge of your field of view, it will appear to rotate. And then, <laughs> yeah. What is that? And, oh, Swiss Army knife. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and that's no good for astrophotography, where you want to be taking long uh, exposures of deep sky objects. It's no good if that object is rotating across your field of view. So you've got problems there. But, uh, but just for going outside and, and looking at the night sky with your eyeballs, which is always great, I, I think they're good. As yeah. long as they work. As with everything, you, you get what you pay for. There are some cheap, not so good go-to telescopes, and there are some more expensive ones that are better. Right. That's right. And uh, I want to pull people... I want to... Uh, so the, the big manufacturers are... 
Celestron and me, those are the two big ones. They will, they have almost every kind of scope you can imagine. And really, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. You're really not going to buy a bad telescope from either one of those guys, I don't think. Would you guys agree with that statement? Really, they don't sell crap. I mean, most of their stuff is really good. <clears throat> there was a yeah. time when in the 80s, 70s and 80s, in the 1970s, Celestron started, and they were the they were king, right? They had the best telescopes. And then Meade came along in the 80s, and they started doing it, and they they sucked. Their stuff was the the mounts were under under uh, constructed. They were wobbly. The clock drives in them were were full of backlash. They were just terrible. But and and Celestrons uh, were the king in the 80s. They had sand casted mounts. They were very sturdy. They were you know you could. But you could like knock the telescope tube and the vibration would go down really fast. You did that on a mead and it'd sit there and shake for, you know, 20 minutes before you could finally look through the eyepiece again. So that was the 80s. Then the 90s came along. Celestron got bought by somebody, some big company, and then they sucked. Who? Sinter, I think. Was it? Okay. They got bought by some big company and their quality went down bad. Then the, then the mead picked up. They were they their stuff was the ones to buy, and that's when I bought my LX two hundred was in the nineties, and it was one of the first go to telescopes, and really it was all in the keypad. I really couldn't do much else with it at the time, uh, and now though you know I think both Celestron's picked up their game with the Next Star series. I really like that telescope, uh, and the LX two hundred of course is still. Uh, if I were going to buy another one, I'd probably buy that. Uh, just because I like those telescopes a lot, and but everything else, the coatings on the mirrors, the optics, the coatings on the corrector plates, all of that stuff, really is done in Japan by the same people, more or less. It used to be Celestron made their own telescopes, and they had the patent for how to make that corrector plate that went out front. It's a very special shape, and <laughs> Celestron had it down for how to make a really good corrector plate. Mead then somehow got a hold of some of that stuff and learned how to make the corrector plates themselves. And then they became much more competitive optically. So the optics, absolutely. I'd put side by side. Now everything else is just little features. Like, do you like the interface? It's like a smartphone, right? Do you like, uh, you know, iOS better or do you like Android? It really is comes down to that. They, they have basically different operating systems and things like that, but both telescope brands, you can plug into things like Stellarium, uh, worldwide telescope, and you can control your computer or control your telescope from your laptop. And like you could be playing around a worldwide telescope and say, oh, I want to see that. And then the telescope will go slew towards it uh, w while it's outside. So that's kind of cool. Um, do you guys agree, though, Me Mead, Celestron? <clears throat> yeah. Others, I would mention uh, Orion, I think, of do course. good. Yeah, now they uh, make go yes, go but telescopes. yeah, they have go-to mounts. Um, Ioptron is another com company I want to put on you guys' radar. They make a, uh, they make just the mounts. You can get just the go-to mount, an alt azimuth mount, for as little as four hundred dollars. Again, with GPS, you can put small telescopes on it. And I have one of those that I'm going to use. I use it with my, my, my PST, my Coronado Solar Telescope. I'll show you that in two weeks. But the, uh, that, that particular uh, mount is great. And it's inexpensive. Like I said, you can buy just the mount, I think, for $700 now. This, I bought, then they, have, they have cheaper ones, depending on the feature set you want. But that's another one. It's iOptron. So go check them out. Um, yes, Orion, absolutely great. Uh, they have all their kind of stuff. You can even buy go-to accessories for Dobsonians, where you can take a Dobsonian and turn it into a go-to telescope. I've never done that. It seems kind of clunky to me. Um, but Hans Milling's got a really good question, guys. Let me read it to you. Uh, most go-to computers won't, for the sake of your eyes, not track the sun. But if you have a solar filter attached, is there a way to fool them to track the sun? Has you have have you noticed that, John, with yours? I'm sure. You, um, mine has a, a sun um, uh, setting. Yeah, it has a mode. So, Hans, what I, they? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm interrupted you. Yeah, um, instead of looking for like M1 or M2, you can look up, look for the planets. I'm sure the sun is also included in that. Yes, Adam, do you have any experience with that? I haven't done much solar observing for a long time, but I would imagine it's quite easy to 
Right. Um, now, my, my old Mead LX200 had a solar mode where I could enter that mode. It, it was like John said, I could, what do I want to look at? Solar system, sun, moon, uh, or deep sky objects. And I could select the sun and it would do that. The newer one, the Ioptron that I have actually had a warning that popped up and said, uh, uh, you're about to look at the sun. Um, you know, don't be suing me if you go blind. It, it didn't say that. But, you know, it was like, yeah, there was a warning that popped up. But, yeah, the ultimate responsibility is on you. And we're going to talk about solar observing next time. But um, that's a good question. Is My experience, though, Hans, is that there may be a warning that pops up on some of them, but I haven't had a problem getting a, getting it to go follow the sun. Uh, and that's also true with you Stellarium, for example. You can control your computer via that or control your telescope via that. And, uh, again, I, I, a warning may pop up, but um, I, have, I haven't been prevented from it, at least. It might be different in the EU, though. You know how the EU is. They warn you about everything. So I'm kidding. <laughs> um, well, I, I really like uh, astrophysics telescopes. Oh cheap. yeah, those are <laughs> yeah. You got you got uh, you got expensive taste there. Those are lovely. Mm. Those are quite nice. Those. Why don't you tell us about them? Well, <laughs> they're nice telescopes. Yeah, they're you refractors can, usually, right? Yeah, uh, they do really good go-to scopes with them. Yeah, and they're, they're every, everything you could want really yeah. for observing the night sky. But they're not cheap at all. There are no. a few. A few thousand pounds. You can spend about five thousand pounds, which is what seven, eight thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's they're, Very they're, quite, they're quite expensive. Um, Toxic Vamp is commenting. I work in school districts and found an old mead in science storage, probably a seventy millimeter. Hey, get that thing out there. Put it out in front of your kids. That's an, you know what that is. If you're careful with how you do it, and you know project the sun or put a solar filter on it yeah, that's a good solar that's a good size for a solar telescope so um i would encourage you to learn how to get it take set it up and and use it. if you got any questions let us know uh if it's a go-to telescope that makes it even better for you um uh david Le- leapart agree i use go to for quick setup at outreach events for my own use i do star hopping yeah, it is nice when people you got a crowd of people and you go, oh, let's look at Saturn. Okay, you know, uh, you, you know, you enter find Saturn, enter go to, and <laughs> off it goes, and everybody's like, wow, look at that telescope slew. And then you look through there, and boom, there's Saturn. So yeah, that's and I love to be the guy to show somebody Saturn through an eyepiece for the first time. It's always it's always funny to re- see their reactions. They're like, oh, wow, that's just like in the pic. Because they see the rings and they see the moons and they're just like freaking out. Whoa, that's amazing. <laughs> I love being that guy. Um, a few people have mentioned um, Skywatcher telescopes, which ah, is, I don't know if you get them in America. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and also very good. They're owned by the same company that owns um, Celestron. They're, that's right. They're sort of a sub-brand, I guess, or a line, a model of telescopes, if you would. Yeah. Yeah, so those are those are designed. Both Mead and Celestron have lines of telescopes designed for different uh, skill levels. They have their beginner scopes, which are, I think they're all good. Um, there was a time when the Discovery Channel used to have a stores and malls out here, and you could buy Mead and Celestron scopes there, and those were actually pretty decent scopes too um but yeah the more serious ones like the one john has uh the the lx200 i used to have and the ones that we're you know some the ones we just showed you from mead um those are more those really because you know two three four thousand dollars uh you really got to make sure you like the hobby before you spend that kind of money but where they shine is in imaging because uh, we're going to do a whole hangout on imaging. But when you attach a, te- a, a camera to a telescope, it's like, I used to sell, com- I'm going to tell you the story. I used to sell computers. And it, and I, I, this was back in the 80s. And I'm showing everybody Apple II Pluses and, and IBM PCs and IBM XTs and all this the really old, old stuff. And they're like, yeah, well, this, you know, so I'm looking for a computer that will do spreadsheets word processing and you know uh oh it'd be nice if maybe it played a few games and the minute they said that i said oh you'd like it to play games 
Well, now you just went to the most expensive computer I can offer you because gaming is going to tax every kind of computer out there. So now you're looking at the best there is. How important is playing games to you? Uh, and so it, just as when buying computers and you want to be a gamer, the same is true for telescopes. I'd like to see Saturn and the Andromeda Galaxy and the Orion Nebula. And oh yeah, it might be nice to take a couple pictures. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Now you've just added a whole different ball uh, level here to this to this ball game, and so uh, the minute you add imaging to the mix, you've got to have a way to track the object. You've got to have a sturdy mount. You've got otherwise you're going to take crap crap pictures. Now we we had Helen and on one of our first hangouts where she had this really cool thing. It's accessory, and we're going to do a hangout on accessories. You can attach to your smartphone and plug it in uh, to the eyepiece uh, holder. And that was kind of cool. And I've never done anything like that. Have you guys ever done that kind of thing? I mean, she says it took good pictures of her of the planets and stuff. Yeah, I've got something similar that you um, attach your compact camera to. And, do you, and how does it work? How does it work okay for It uses the lens in the camera, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I just want to say that, you know, all of that is just to say that you need a go-to mount for imaging, but imaging, you need a lot more for that to be a successful endeavor, uh, not the least of which is a sturdy, sturdy mount. Um, and you, need a, you need a polar-aligned uh, mount as well, not a, yeah, an I old azimuth. Yeah, you can, get of, a, you can get away without azimuth as long as your exposures aren't longer than, say... I don't know. Thirty half a minute seconds. Yeah, 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 that's about right. Right. Yeah, you can you can take pictures of reasonably bright deep sky objects. Yeah, the no moon problem. or something like that. Yeah, the moon easily. But if you want to take nice pictures of galaxies or planetary nebula, star clusters, anything like that, you need an equatorial uh, polar aligned mount. Yeah. And, and you need good, strong motors as well, right? Uh, uh, and precise. Very, you need very precise alignment to keep the telescope tracking the object that you want to be looking at. Now, John, I, when when you showed us your picture of the uh, equatorial mounted uh, Newtonian that you had, it looked like it was on a. Did you put it up on a deck? What do you have some kind of decking, or is it sitting on the ground in your in your in your garden? It's just sitting on the ground. Oh, it is on the ground. Okay, it looked elevated a little bit. Um, I was going to ask you, do you leave it set up all the time, or do you take it down after each use? Okay. Uh, I have to take it down. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, so some sometimes that makes it a little bit easier to go out. If you, if you can manage to set up a little shed or something in your back garden where you can just open up the shed and suddenly you're observing, that helps a lot with this polar alignment issue. But... Um, uh, my uh, Hans is going back to my e my Mead ETX eighty AT does not have the sun, but you can add an asteroid that orbits like one meter from the center of the sun and fool it to track the sun. You know, Hans, it's possible that some of these maybe earlier beginner telescopes might have that sort of quote unquote safety feature. I don't know. Have you guys seen it? I've not seen it. No, I've never seen that. Yeah, so it's possible. That if it's one of the sort of quote first telescopes, then maybe maybe they do that. But um, I'm glad you found a way around it. You do want to be smart about it, though, um, and uh, you know, and <laughs> don't be looking at the, the telescope through a sun at, under any circumstances, unless you've got a a Java one like I do, which we'll talk about again. Okay, so we talked a little bit about imaging. I don't want to go too much into it, but another reason why you need uh, a sturdy mount for uh, cameras is that cameras are like taking a um, removing a 40 millimeter eyepiece and putting in like a 3 millimeter eyepiece <laughs> and trying to see through it they have very narrow fields of view that's something called pixel scale and they see tiny parts of the sky at one time which means that you're effectively working at a very high magnification and so the um, mount will wobble a heck of a lot more Back in the day, 
you could put a webcam on those telescopes. But now, I'm not sure that people do that anymore. Do you guys know? You can um, still get some. Yeah. Can you, can, can you still do it? Okay. Uh, yeah. There was one webcam in particular. It was a Philips webcam. It still had a CCD instead of one of the CMOS chips. And uh, I, I put it on my... I used it as a uh, uh, planetary imager because it could you could only take very short exposures because it was a video camera. And... Uh, uh, it was really great, to, and I needed. I used it on my LX200 for that. I took a lot of good pictures of Mars with that. Um, so, okay. So, uh, what do you? What do we? Um, where do we want to go from here? We, have we have we said anything we, we wanted to say about go to telescopes? Um, well, you can obviously buy um, go to altazimuth mounts and go to um, Dobsonian mounts as well. Right. Um, obviously, it costs more money. Um, but do you really need them? No. <laughs> yeah, that with those. Well, again, it depends. The, the advantage of putting a go-to capability on a Dobsonian, for example, is if you don't, you've already spent say eight hundred, nine hundred dollars on a nice Dobsonian. It's got ten inches. Let's say you got a ten-inch aperture, really beautiful uh, views of the night sky, and um, you don't want to spend money on another telescope. <laughs> <laughs> but you do want that capability, and you're still going to use your Dobsonian every bit as much, maybe even more if you put it on there. Then I would say, yeah, go ahead, buy a buy a kit. They're usually in some kind of kit form where you have to install it on there. I, I don't, they don't usually come with this ability. But Orion, for example, um, you can buy out go to or Altazimuth go to kits for their uh, for their Dobsonians, and you can install it yourself. So that's kind of cool. And they're a couple hundred, three hundred bucks, something like that. Uh, it's been my experience, but they're kind of limited. They're not super, you know, super sophisticated or anything like that, but they do work and they do work quite well. And they're also good if you build your own telescope with a Dobsonian and you just want a clock drive capability for it. So, and if you've ever wondered how you want to polar align a Dobsonian, what you can do is get two big pieces of plywood about 10 inches on a side, hinge, hinge one of them. Okay. Make it really thick plywood too, like three quarters of an inch or so. And make it so that it does like this, okay? You mount the telescope on one half of that, uh, on one half of that wedge you've just made, and and figure out some way of holding the two wedges apart. It can be a dowel, it can be a turnbuckle, it can be some kind of thing. But your goal is to get the cradle of the Dobsonian to point toward the North Star at the latitude where you're at and you can get a pretty it, it works pretty good it works i've done it i've seen it done quite a few times and there you've suddenly gone from being alt azimuth to polar aligned and as adam said you want to do that to avoid rotation field rotation in the eyepiece so um there was one other question i got last week that i want to cover about people were confused when we were talking last week guys about the um Hang on, did my stream just die? No, it says uh, it's good. Oh, okay, good. I thought the stream died. Uh, the difference between, when we were talking about focusers, or IP sizes, the word inch and a quarter versus two inch. Let's go back to that a minute. And I, and to do that, John, if you wouldn't mind while we're talking, put your telescope picture back. Oh, you actually have some. That's, that's even better. Um, we were talking about the diameter of the bit that fits into the eyepiece holder. And there are two sizes. There's an inch and a quarter diameter, and there's a two inch diameter. And John is looks like he's holding up an inch and a quarter. You see that silver metal tube? That is the part that goes in the eyepiece holder. And then the other one that he's holding up, the much larger one, that's a two inch diameter tube. And that's what we were talking about. Now, John's telescope has a two inch um, focuser on it, meaning that most telescopes, when you buy them, are inch and a quarter because the eyepiece you get with the telescope is an inch and a quarter. But you can buy a two inch diameter focuser to hold the larger eyepieces. And those bigger eyepieces, those, the bigger one that John had, those the, the really large ones that are basically small telescopes in them, themselves, require a two inch focuser. So that's what we were talking about last week. We were talking about that. So. Uh, Alexander Reinders is asking us, Tony, how about collimation of Newtonians? It's important, exclamation mark. No, it isn't. What's, what's so important about collimation? First of all, tell us what it is, guys. 
collimation is um, aligning the the mirrors inside um, a Newtonian telescope so that um, the light comes straight down the centre of the eyepiece and obviously um, into your eye. Um, Newtonians are um, notorious for the primary mirror to go out of alignment. Um, it is a skill that you, that any Newtonian telescope owner will have to learn. Um, for the, fir the first time I, I did it, it took me about two hours. Nowadays, it takes me about 10 minutes. And I do it before I take that telescope out observing. Yeah. And it's a good skill to learn. You learn your optical system. It's a good way to, uh, you know, bond with your telescope. <laughs> well, you definitely bond with it after, after yeah. the Yeah, so you're getting down to the nitty-gritty of it. I mean, you just can't help it. With some of these optical components, you need to be able to uh, line them up. And that's true even with Schmidt-Cassegrain telescopes where the, t where the tube is essentially sealed off from you. You can't really get in there. But they do give you collimating adjustment screws in the secondary to um to line up the optics and so you want those optics to be as lined up as perfectly as possible just so you don't get a lot of artifacts or a lot of you can focus better better yeah, i've never done it on man man's a maxit of cassegrain um they may not have possible. them actually with those i've seen the, well, the, the, the um, automated schools at the back are there oh okay yeah right. but it's not at the front so on, on the schmidt cassegrain there's also collimated schools on the front yes that's what i'm talking schmidt about mm -hmm. yep yep um now one thing about collimation, you can get um, laser collimators, mm. and everybody thinks that because it's got the word laser um, in it, it must be the bee's knees. It isn't. Really? What well, is, what's it. wrong with them? I've unless never used you one. Buy, well, unless you buy a really expensive one, the first thing you've got to do is collimate the collimator. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay. <laughs> I've always <laughs> thought it must be hard to keep it straight. <laughs> well, you get two bits of bits of wood, and you put put a V in them like that, so that like that. You put the um, collimator. I'll use a torch in like that, and you and you rotate it at um, a flat surface as far away as possible, like so. And you keep a, just some screws, some um, along the body. And you keep adjusting them until, as you rotate it, the um, the laser beam stays in in exactly the same position. Um, I haven't got a laser collimator. I'm not going to buy one. They're not needed. <laughs> but expensive like... and a waste of time. Instead, use a collimating cap, which costs about five pound, um, to do the secondary mirror. And a Cheshire eyepiece, which costs about twenty pounds, thirty pounds, to um, to do the main um, primary 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 mirror. Okay, How does so that work? Um, well, it's a lot. It's Is it? a long process. It, there's um, a very good um, site called Astro Babe, um, and she tells you how Astro to go. Babe. Astro Babe, yeah. Oh, wow. And she tells you um, all about collimating a Newtonian telescope. Okay. And, yeah, the, so you... How much are those laser collimators, by the way? Um, I think you can pick them up for... About maybe 20 about quid? 30 pounds or so, yeah. but no. Yeah, <laughs> you sound um, like you got a philosophical uh, problem about it. <laughs> I just won't do it. <laughs> if you want a good one, it's going to cost them um, over a hundred pound. Yeah, and it'll still maybe need collimating. Um, okay, they're just not needed. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those gimmicky things that you just people just buy just because they have. It's a thing you can do for your hobby. Uh, Uncle it's, Bill is commenting that barn door mount sure works well for Dobsonians in northern latitudes. It if too far south, the balance issue gets messy. That's right. What I was describing was basically a barn door uh, mount with the two pieces of plywood in the thing. So, yeah. Thank you, Uncle Bill. The much cheaper alternative to uh, an equatorial mount. If you can't afford an equatorial mounted telescope, that's a very cheap option mm -hmm. that, that, that works. Can, 
work equally well. That's right. Yeah. So you can get into this hobby for a couple hundred bucks, folks, and really just have a lot of fun. The stuff we're talking about now is gravy, right? I mean, it's just stuff where, you know, gosh, I, you know, I've tried to find the Crab Nebula. It's too faint. I, I must be looking right at it, but I can't see it. Uh, and, you know, you can kind of, if, if your go-to telescope is saying it should be in there, uh, you can maybe trust that a little bit more. But I've seen plenty of times where it says it's looking right at it, and I can't see it. So um, it's give and take. But if you want, if you know you're into amateur astronomy, you know you love this stuff, and you know you're going to use it, then go out and get yourself a go-to telescope with an eye towards maybe buying a camera later. It'll hold a camera. Um, you can do really great uh, star fields by mounting it, by piggybacking just a regular old SLR on top of it and have just turn on the clock drive and have it follow the sky uh, for a while. You get some beautiful star fields that way. That's different than star trails because star trails are even easier to take. You just put that on a, put the camera on a rock somewhere and open the, open the shutter and you've got a star trail. Um, but if you want to pinpoint stars, then you could do it that way. So I don't know. I guess I, I'm ambivalent about go-to telescopes. I didn't use mine any more than I used some of the other ones. I, I tell you what though, when I wanted to go out and observe, I use my astro scan and I just go set it up outside and I take a look at stuff like that. Um, for example, when I went to go look at the ISS last night, um, I just grabbed my binoculars and went out there. Um, I don't miss having a lot of setup in a, in a telescope. I don't miss that at all. Um, and the, the, the Mead 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrains, they're, they're like 70 pounds. You know, you're going to take, what is that? That's, um, four stones, something like that. I'm thinking <laughs> I have to do the conversions. One stone is 16 pounds. It's about 20 pounds. So it's about three or four stone uh, for a Schmidt Cassegrain. And that's a lot of weight to be lugging around. Well, it was for me. I put mine on wheels so I could, you know, kind of roll it everywhere. That was so, a good idea. Yeah, because they came, in, they came in a trunk, and the trunk was I couldn't lift it by myself, so I just put it on, on a, uh, wheels, and I was able to, like a big suitcase, roll it around. And that's what I ended up doing. So, um Uncle Bill, are there are there are the tiny zero point nine something Japanese focusers still something we need from the hobby a long time? Yeah, um, back in the day, you could buy like a Pentax refractor, um, and they had these not one inch focusers, but it was like point nine inch. It was just a you know probably a metric thing, but um, it was just a oh, little bit thinner, nine. huh? Yeah. Point nine six two, I think it was. Yeah, that was that was it. Point nine six two, I remember now. Do they still make those? I don't think so, but you can buy adapters, so you, so so that you can fit um yeah um, one and a quarter inch eyepieces onto one of the um, point nine six two telescopes and vice versa. It is yeah, and and it isn't that they were inherently bad eyepiece designs because they weren't. They were made by reputable companies, like I said, like Pentax and stuff, but. Uh, it's just that some of the comp some of the cheaper department store telescopes came with that style, and the eyepiece the eyepiece uh, focal lengths was like eight millimeters and six millimeters, something way too high magnification for anybody to really use, and uh, say or you know effectively. So that's why you ended up getting warned about them. But there was nothing wrong with that particular size eyepiece. Uh, it just most of the cheap scopes came with that size. Okay. Um, so, do you guys see any questions or comments we need to get to? Uh, Let's see. Yeah. I'm reading. Oh. The... Somazo T8M is saying they've just bought some uh, Celestron Skymaster 20 by 80 binoculars. How do you like those? I'm they're, just having a look good. at them. They look, yeah, they look pretty good to me. I've never used them myself. I had a, I had a pair uh, a long time ago, and I gave them to a friend just as a gift, and uh, I never bothered to, um, never, bother, never bothered to get them again, uh, replace them. But I'll tell you what I think of them. They're great. Uh, they got really wide field. They got two, it's about having two eighty millimeter telescopes. Very good for the planets, the moon, um, uh, bird watching. But they're too big for me to hold. 
for any length of time. They're massive telescopes. And so, you know, they get heavy after a while. and Or massive telescopes. Massive binoculars. And they get too heavy for me after a while. And I feel like i got to um, put mine down. I, or, so I need a, you need a tripod on those uh, for sure. But uh, they're great for bird watching too, if you're a bird watcher. Or wildlife enthusiast. They're really good for that also. Um, I just found uh, some go-to scopes. Can we have a look? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, good. You bought, you bought a tripod too. That's good. You see those? Uh, yep, we can see them. Oh, uh, yeah. Press uh, Messier Exos. Six hundred ninety-two pounds. The right. on advanced Fiat mount. That's just the mount. Seven hundred ninety-nine pounds. Yeah. These are just these are just the mounts. You don't get the telescope with it. The Lestron Pro computerized mount. Three thousand eight hundred ninety-five. That's got to be pretty much the top of the range. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... The Lestron mount this one right but look at that i mean it's beefy i mean although i would like it to be a little beefier those those um those axes looked a little bit they look a little thin to me based on just the picture but mm. but i like the adjustments you can it looks like it's got a lot of fine control on it things like that yeah what else have we got they're cheaper so that's the that's wrong one yeah, now these are all mounts that you can get. I'm mean, going to put any kind of your own telescope tube on it. Oh, there's the ioptron stuff I was telling you about. At least that's a that's an adapter anyway. Um, see if they have any ioptron mounts. Um, just good. type in, t yeah, type in that. Uh, because I love those. I have one. It's a real simple one of the first ones they ever came out with. Uh, and it's really nice. Look at that, 12,000 pounds for that. What was that? Go back up. Whoa. What was that twelve thousand pound telescope? Me, me, I like eight fifty. I know. Oh, it's a fourteen inch. That's why. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's huge. That's that's a professional grade for sure. You'll you'll want to build an observatory around something like that. That looks beautiful, isn't it? Oh yeah. Well. <laughs> and these Skywatcher mounts are really nice. Uh, I, I've heard great things about them, and they they really hold up well. I've never used one personally, but look at that price four hundred pounds. You can't go wrong with that. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, even these 350 ones are pretty good. So, um, and well, what you can get now is um, keep it there. I don't, um, I'll down a bit, Adam. Oh, sorry, I meant up, back up. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, up, up a bit. S slowly up. Well, I must go the other way. Down again, then. <laughs> what surfing? What? Surfing the well, web. A new series of mounts out now that uh, um, Altazimuth EQ. Right, yeah. And it had one in there. A good, um, this, is an a bit that, this is an echo. The Sky Watchers are equatorial. Uh, equatorial, equatorial, equatorial. That's the one, I think. Altazimuth. Ah, uh, yes, that's a good one. That's a nice one, actually. Uh, it's Altazimuth and. It is uh, looks really and small and portable it. as well. Yeah. That's not it. I'll tell them with the EQ five. Oh, thousand bucks or a thousand pounds. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, that's pretty nice. But with that one, you get the um, best of both worlds. You can use it as an EQ mount or as an Altezimuth mount. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's both. Both, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's EQ. Oh, that looks cool. really nice. Okay. Have we had enough? Okay, yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> uh, do, do they, well, just do, see if they've got uh, the ioptrons since I talked about them and I recommended them. See if they've got any of those there. They don't have any in this list. Oh, okay. Maybe telescopes.com has them. Um, uh, Wavenod is commenting, I'm still using Zeiss 7x30s. Really good binoculars and no need for a tripod. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I would love to have a pair of Zeiss binoculars. Those are outstanding. So way to go. I'm glad you got a pair. Definitely hang on to those. Uh, David Lep Lepard, I bought the uh, Selectron AVX Equatorial. Very happy with it. Uh, Alexander Rangers, to uh, Tony, do they have Avalon mounts? I don't know what an Avalon mount is. Do you guys know? 
not on the website. Oh, I just love that. Yeah. What's an Avalon Mountain, Alex? I, I, Alexander, I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, is it a brand or is, is it, it's not a type? So, I assume it's a brand. It's not one of, that I heard of. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I don't know what that is on there. Um, uh, Uncle Bill, those who already have quality photography equipment can mount directly on those mounts without a scope at all. Um, that's true. You can take your your DLSL, DLSLR uh, and put it right on there. That's true in a lot of cases. Um, uh, so I'm just looking at Kevin Daniels on Facebook going, what's this? <laughs> this is a hangout where we're talking about telescopes, uh, Kevin. So there you go. Um all right. Uh, okay, I think that's everything. All right. Well, I guess we'll. Well, we're almost out of time anyway. Uh, so that is. Any final comments you guys want to make on go to telescopes? Um, you can only buy one if you really need one. Otherwise, stick with um, the standard mount. It's a lot cheaper, and you'll um, learn how to look, how to find your way around the sky a lot faster. I agree. I don't think you need to buy them uh, myself either, unless you know you've been at this a while and you're, you've already got the bug and you're going to be out observing quite a bit uh, and with, with the telescope. Then I say absolutely. What about you, Adam? Yeah, some people think that they absolutely have to have a go-to mount because it's computerized, it's cool, it's the new thing, but uh, they're not absolutely necessary. Yeah. Uh, like you it depends how much use you're going to get out of it. That really is what it comes down to. They're not easier to use, folks. You're going to have more setup time uh, than, than you are with your Dobsonian or your AstroScan or whatever it is you're setting up. It's going to take you longer. You Because of that, it may be more of a hassle, and you may be thinking to yourself, well, do I want to go out tonight or not? And the hassle of setting it up might be just enough to cause you to stay inside and watch Gogglebox or something. So, yeah, it's... Uh, nice. nice to have. I wouldn't say to anyone... Don't get a go-to mount. Right. But, uh, just that you don't have to have one. They're not absolutely necessary. Yeah, and you, all of your <laughs> setup time is sort of upfront. You know, you've got to worry about, you know, getting it all aligned and ready to go before you can do observing. With the Dobsonians, you just go tear it out there, set it on the ground, and then you you spend most of your time looking for stuff um, that way. Oh, another advantage of an EQ of um, a go-to mount is that um, it will. Um, track the object that you're um, viewing, obviously. And in some cases, um, especially under high magnification, if that's the object you're looking at, at the end of this pen, it's going to go out of out of view very quickly. Um, and so you're going to be spending a lot more time with an altazimuth mount or with um, an undriven um, equatorial getting that object back into view. Um, whereas obviously with the go-to mount, it's going to be in the centre of view all the time. Mm. You can spend a lot more time actually viewing, as opposed to getting the, getting the object back into the um, viewfinder. And that's important, right? You want to spend as much time as you can actually with your eye at the eyepiece observing. You don't want to be messing about with your telescope. Right. That's a good point. Yep. So very good. Okay, folks. Well, I guess we're out of time. We're going to stop there. I want to thank everybody for commenting and giving us questions on this. I hope this is helping. I hope this uh, Hangout series is something that you find useful. If so, please leave comments down below and let us know. Uh, we will keep doing them for as long as you keep watching them. And we got lots more to talk about. We'll, we'll be back in two weeks where we will talk about the solar eclipse that's hitting America by storm. I... Really? There's a what, Tony? A, a solar eclipse? Really? Yeah, what there's some, something that? happening next month. I don't know. This the American wow. losing its mind over it. I'm kind of wow. a, I'm such a contrarian. I, I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I don't even have plans to go see it yet. I'm gonna go, but it's like, uh, I, whenever everybody else wants to go do something, it makes me not want to do it. So it's like I'm fighting it. But uh, it is an amazing event, and it is something that I have. I, I saw the 1979 one in Helena, Montana. And so I, I, I'm going to be a part of this one as well because I'm old. But, um, yeah, so I'll be, we'll be talking about that in two weeks. The solar eclipse is hitting the United States. So if you want to learn more about where to be, what to see, what to use, how to look at the sun through your telescope, then that will be the one to, uh, to watch. Okay. Thanks, guys. This has been a lot of fun. Cheers, Tony. All right, guys. 
John, All right. bye. All right. Bye. 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 I want to thank everybody for watching. And as always, keep, keep looking up. Keep looking up. Bye-bye. <laughs>